thank you that your word is truth. Your word sanctifies us. Your word grows us. Your word is a firm foundation. Your word is a refuge. Your word is bread. Your word is a well. Thank you, God, that your word is counsel. Your word is instruction. Your word transforms us. And today, God, we, we've come to worship around your word. We've come to sit at your feet and hear you as you instruct us, as you correct us, as you equip us, as you strengthen us, as you encourage us, and as you position us to be the people of God in this day and hour. We reverence your word, we honor your word, we submit ourselves to your word. Lord, give us an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying in this very hour. We ask God that we leave this place different than we came. And Lord, not by our own will or our own disciplines or devices, but we leave here changed because the Spirit of God has shaped us and formed us to look more like, love like, lead like, and live like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Can you say amen? It's a good word. Amen. So be it in my life. In the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul charges us with, with this. Take up or put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to withstand. Can you just say that word with me? Withstand. That means to stand. But it means to stand your ground. So that you will be able to stand your ground when? It's on the screen. When? In the evil day. No doubt Paul is talking about the evil that we will encounter um, in the days of our life. But I also believe that Paul is pointing to a time in history when the days will be predominantly, greatly influenced, dictated by evil. We are living in those days. They're not coming. They're here. We're living in that time. We are living in the evil day. Could it get worse? Yes. Are we on the threshold? No doubt. To Pastor Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, thus his church. He says this in 2 Timothy. He says, Timothy, listen, I want you to know this. That in the last days, perilous. That word perilous. Every word has meaning in Scripture. A good student of the Word will, will learn to study the words in the Word. That word perilous means difficult, dangerous, furious, hard, challenging, can I get a witness? Anybody had any hard, challenging? I'm not talking about self-inflicted hard days. I'm talking about just, I woke up and I was pursuing the Lord. I was doing everything right and just chaos and confusion and, and, and disappointment and hardship all around me. Paul says, know this, that in the last days they'll be characterized. You, you'll, you'll know that you're in them because the times will be perilous. They will be difficult times and they will come. Paul goes on to describe, and we can't take you there for the sake of time, but, but if you read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he goes on and he, and he begins to give a list of what those perilous times will look like and what they will include. And, and, if, and if you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, you read it and you're like, oh my gosh, did, did I just watch the news? Did I just read the newspaper? Because we're there. We're there. We are in perilous times. But I've got good news. You ready? 
It's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any better around us. It's not going to get any better out there. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, my flesh doesn't like that either. But in my spirit, because I know the counsel of God's word, I know God's word, this is simply a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a fulfillment of scripture. I'm comforted to know that God is still in control. That's my comfort. My peace is not in this world. Is peace in the world enjoyable? Absolutely. Should we be those who make peace? Absolutely. But there is something going on around you that you cannot dictate, you cannot control. And it is the promise, thus the prophecy of God. No matter who you vote into office, and we believe in voting... But no matter what the laws we create or what boycotts prevail, the evil day is upon us, and we are in the evil day. And Jesus foretold of this day. You're living in the days of unfolding prophecy. That's exciting. Jesus said this day would come, and, and, and we find ourselves in this day. And just a side note, remember, Romans chapter 5 teaches us that, that when evil abounds, don't be disheartened because grace will that much more abound. So, so there's good news in the midst of bad news, that as evil abounds, grace will that much more abound. So as you feel more and more surrounded by evil, there's an opportunity, there's an invitation for the people of God to experience the grace of God at a deeper and greater level. Amen. So we're living in perilous times. We're living in an evil day. We can't run from it. We can't escape it. As a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 5 teaches us not to run from the evil day, but it says to walk wise in the evil day. So we need to learn that. We need to learn how to not escape it, but how to walk in it with wisdom. So what does wisdom do in the evil day? How do we walk wise in perilous times? The evil that permeates and that is active in the evil day, it has a mission. Its mission is your destruction. It wants to destroy you. It wants to destroy your family. It wants to destroy every blessing and promise of God. That is evil's mission. Evil has but one mission, and it is to steal, kill, and destroy. Every one of us are hated by, the, by evil because we're loved by God. And say, I don't like that. I don't want evil to hate me. Well, sorry. You're loved by God. And because you're loved by God, you're hated by evil. And because you're loved so much by God, you're a threat to Satan. You're a threat to evil. You're a target. So how will we be able to withstand in the evil day? How can we live victoriously in the day that is evil? How can we, how can we uh, live as overcomers in this hour? How do we conquer the fear that is at work seeking to, to, to prevail in our life? How do we live in the world but not live of the world? How do we do that? I want you to know that God has promises for his people in this day. God has already prepared. He's already made provisions for his people in the evil day. They're all throughout his word, but today I want to take you to Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is 16 verses, and we're going to read all of them today. But I want you to pay close attention to three verses. Verses 1, 9, and 14. We're going to read all 16 verses, but there's three verses in the entire chapter that are extremely important. They're critical. The reason I need us to zero in on those three verses is because Psalm 91 is actually a long list of God's blessing and God's promise to His people. How many like blessings? 
Well, you're getting ready to hear a lot of them. But you have to understand God's blessing in your life is conditional. Do you understand that? In order for you to experience God's blessing, there are conditions. God's love is not conditional. But God's blessing is conditional. If you want to be loved by God, you don't have to do anything. Just breathe. You're automatically loved. As a matter of fact, God will never stop loving you. God's always loved you. God will always loved you, love you. But if you want the blessing of God, you must position yourself correctly. You must act. There, there's, there's, there's something that we do in order to receive God's blessing in our life. God will do His part, blessing, if we do our part. And He's going to tell us what our part is in verse 1, 9, and 14. Out of 16 verses, three of the verses tell us what we're going to do. And what's 16 minus 3? That's 13. Okay? For those of y'all still trying to calculate that. Okay? 13 verses are God telling us what he's going to do. A little unfair, wouldn't you think? But that's God. God's generous. God's going to do exceedingly abundantly above and more than, than we could even think or imagine. So he's telling us, and, 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 and actually, it's not three different things. All three verses, he's telling us to do one thing. The same thing in three different verses. So really, we do one thing, and he does a bunch of other things. Psalm chapter 91, starting in verse 1, and I'm going to read it. You are welcome to follow along. I'm reading in the New King James Version, and I say that because there's so many versions in today's world. You may be reading a different version. It doesn't mean that I'm wrong and you're right or you're wrong and I'm right. It's just, just different. Psalm chapter 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God, and in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. By the way, there's a lot of imagery in this uh, uh, chapter. Uh, the, 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 the arrow that flies by day could be many things, but, it, but it's those things that seek to... to, to, to uh, harm you and hurt you and attack you just out of nowhere and even from a distance. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at new day. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. How many know if a thousand start to fall and then 10,000 start to fall, that becomes concerning. How many would agree, uh-oh, that, that, I, I, I get concerned when destruction is around me and, and the psalmist is telling you, even though you see that, it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Verse 9 because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That's a pretty good verse to know during a pandemic. 
For he shall give his angels charge over you. I'm going to read that one again. I like that one. We need to understand the ministry of angels. For he shall give his angels charge over you. Well, what are they going to do? Well, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And then those same feet will do what? Tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Now, before we move on to verse 14 and finish, I want you to see that verses 1 through 13 is a very lengthy and detailed promise of God's protection. That's what God's trying to communicate to us. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you. When you feel like you have no defense, I will be your defense. I will protect you. I want you to trust me. That's what God's speaking to us. You can trust me. I will defend you. I will be your shield. I will be your buckler. I will protect you even when you see thousands falling around you. I have my eyes set on you. I will protect you. Protect you from the things that seek to hurt you and harm you and destroy you. But again, his protection is conditional, church. That's the blessing of God. This is what he's promising to do for us, but it is conditional. We have to do our part if God's going to do his part. Protection is not automatic with the love of God. Protection comes when I choose to obey God. And then specifically what we're going to learn in just a moment, there's something he's telling us that we must do. Verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, and watch here, here's seven more promises. Watch this. Therefore, I will deliver him... I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call on me and I'll not turn a deaf ear. I will hear him and I will answer him. Here's another one. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Anybody awake here this morning? I'll be a few. Uh huh. Yeah. Huh. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Something. I will deliver him and I will honor him. Boy, if God's honoring you, don't matter what man's doing. Oh, I like this one. With long life. That means you can eat bacon and you're going to be okay. It's not what that means. You need to steward that temple. Turkey bacon. With long life and I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation can we just take two seconds and just honor the lord for his word that's so good thank you jesus now in verses 1 through 13 we see god's promise to protect us protection he promised to protect us from the snare the pestilence the terror by night the arrow of the day destruction and plague then in verses 14 through 16, we see God's promise to not just protect us, but to what? Provide for us. Provide for us. God promises to deliver us, set us on high. If we call on him, he'll answer us, be with us in trouble, deliver us, honor us with long life. He will satisfy us and he will show us his salvation. Now, how many would agree that if you're living in the evil day, you must have God's protection. You must have God's provision. How many would agree? Well, God promises them if we position ourselves for them. Receiving God's promises depend on our position. All of God's promises are dependent on our position. His promise responds to my position and if i'm at a distance with god i do not open the door of my life to the promises of god 
Receiving God's promises depend on our position, and the psalmist tells us what our position should be in verses 1, 9, and 14. Did anybody catch it? I ask you to pay attention now. Verses 1, 9, and 14 is the position that we have to take if we want to experience the promises of God. Verse 1, the psalmist tells us that it's the one who chooses to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. The one who chooses to abide. Everybody say abide. The one who chooses, and it is a choice. It is not natural to our flesh, and everything in this life is working against this decision to dwell and to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In verse 2, he goes on to say, or excuse me, verse 9, the psalmist tells us that it is the one who makes the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Anybody sense a theme here? And then in verse 14, he tells us that it is the one who has set his love. Do you know that you control your love? You are the one who aims your love. You can aim it at God. You can set it on God or you can set it on the affections of this world. The Lord has given us this, this beautiful thing but, but burdensome thing called free will. And he gives us the choice to either set our love on him or, or set it on the things of this world. And by the way, God loves us with his whole heart and he expects the same for us, from us. God will not take and honor a half-hearted love. It has to be all of my heart set on all of him. So the theme here, the psalmist tells us that, he, that this is what he says. Here's a summary. He says, God's protection and God's provision is reserved for the one who chooses to abide or dwell in the presence of God. God's protection, God's provision is set upon, it's aimed at, it's reserved for, it will be experienced by the person who makes a choice and learns how to abide in the presence of God. This ta the, 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 the psalmist is talking about a state of being. It's a state of mind. He's highlighting the focus of a person's life. The daily discipline of a person. He's talking about us fixing our desires and our intentions on something, specifically on someone who is greater than what's around us. God will protect, God will provide for those who are choosing to, learning to. How many would agree that, that, that those that, that have learned to abide in the presence of God, you've got to learn how to do that. That's a discipline. Amen. It's no doubt a desire, but you have to learn to abide in His presence. You don't have to learn how to worry. You don't have to learn how to fear. You don't have to learn how to, 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 to lust. You don't have to learn how to give in to the desires of the flesh, but you do have to learn how to abide in His presence. You do have to learn and give yourselves to, to, to continually seeking His face. And the psalmist says, for the one who chooses to place this as the top priority of their life, abiding in His presence, dwelling in His presence, God will respond. And let me clarify that you can do this at school, you can do this at work, you can do this in the car, you can do this at Walmart, you can even do it at Target, you can do it in the woods, you can do it in a crowd, you can do it when you're all alone, you can do it in the morning, you can do it at night, 
You can do it in the middle of the night. You can do it in a hospital. You can do it with friends. You can do it when you're surrounded by enemies. It is possible. And let me say that it is critical that you and I learn to abide and dwell in the secret place of the Most High. To make the Most High our dwelling place. Let me say it like this. There is an intensity that is coming in the days before us that if you do not learn this, you will not make it. That sounds a little harsh, Brad. It's the truth. It's just the truth. And if someone said they love me, I would want them to tell me the truth. The word abide has always captured my attention. And I, and I don't necessarily know why. Maybe because it's short and easy to spell. But the word abide has always captured my attention. The word abide means to dwell. It means to stay permanently. It means to endure, believe it or not. It means to tarry. T-A-R-R-Y, not T-E-R-R-Y. It means to lodge. It means to continue. And watch this. It even means to abstain from. Isn't that interesting? To abide also means to abstain from because if you're going to remain in something, you have to make a choice to abstain from something, right? God does not honor compromise. He does not honor lukewarmness. He doesn't honor me when I've got a little bit of my heart over here and a little bit of my heart over here. God will not allow us to have two addresses and be on the receiving end of his promises. God will not uh, allow dual dwelling for his people. Either we live in Christ or we live in the flesh. Either we live in the kingdom or we live in the world. Either we abide in the presence of God or we abide outside of his presence. I can't think of the word abiding, can't talk about abiding, and not think of John chapter 15. Did anybody think about John 15 when you heard the word abide? I, I love John 15. It, it's probably one of my favorite chapters in the whole Word of God, and I got a lot of them. But John chapter 15 is Jesus essentially saying the same thing that the psalmist just said. And I don't... I don't have the time to read you the whole uh, chapter, but I do want to highlight for you a couple of verses in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, this is Jesus speaking, and in verse 5, he says this, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Okay, he's talking about relationship here. He's talking about connection. Branches have to be connected to the vine if they're going to bear fruit. He's talking about proximity. He's talking about closeness here. He says, listen, in this relationship, you're the branches, I'm the vine, and watch this. He who abides in me. He who dwells. He who uh, stays continuously. He who endures. He who abstains from so that they give themselves to. He who abides in me and I in him, I like that part, will do what? They will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And then he goes on, if, again, that's a conditional word. If you abide in me, meaning you don't have to, you have the choice not to, and there's plenty of things in this world that are competing for your attention that would, that would love for you to abide in them and not in Him. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, I like that part too, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Whoo, that's good. 
But that ain't what we're talking about today, okay? So sorry. <laughs> By this, my Father is glorified. And here's the focus, that you bear much fruit. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about production. Production. Unfortunately, there's a lot of unproductive saints in the body of Christ. I've had seasons where there was no fruit in my life. There was no production. There was nothing that was happening in my life of, 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 uh, of any effect that, that, was, that I felt was bringing true glory to God. And thank God that he's merciful in those things. Thank God he's long-suffering. Thank God he is patient. Thank God that, that, that if he started a good work in me, he's going to bring it to completion. This wasn't God's fault. This is not something he did. This is something that, that I allowed to happen. And we've got all kinds of names for them. Wilderness. Desert, dry season, backslidden. I mean, I don't know what it's called, but, but I've experienced those seasons. He's talking about being fruitful. He's talking about accomplishing something great for the glory of God, even in the evil day. Because abiding in God's presence isn't just about my protection. It isn't just about my provision. It's about my production. Because being a disciple of Jesus isn't just about what I get. It's also about what I give. It's also about what I accomplish for the glory of God. We're still commissioned, even in an evil day, even more so in an evil day to be a witness and to be a light. We're still filled with the Spirit of God to produce fruit. So if we're going to live victoriously in the evil day, we must abide in God's presence. That's what the psalmist is trying to teach us. That's what he's trying to communicate to us. But when it comes to our protection, our provision, and our production, guess what? There's a problem. By the way, that's four P's in a row. It's always a goal of mine. You know why it's a goal of mine? Because I had trouble learning and comprehending growing up. And I need it easy. So I teach like I like to learn. There's a problem. And we've already alluded to it. We've already pointed to evil and its mission. Its mission is destruction. But I want you to understand this. You need to understand this. Scripture says to be, to be wise concerning the kind, cunningness of the enemy. Any, any, any good soldier, any effective soldier, and I've never been a soldier, but I've known a few of them. There, there, there is an aspect to, to, to who they are and what they do. They take time to study the enemy. And I want you to know that long before, or excuse me, Satan doesn't walk in the front door of your life with destruction. That's too obvious. Especially for the believer. We know how to cast out Demons. We just don't know what to do with the little foxes. So Satan never, never walks in the front door of your life with destruction. He always comes around the back with, 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 with distraction. The enemy has schemes. He's clever. He doesn't destroy a life in one night. He destroys it over the course of many seasons. The challenge to living a life of abiding in God's presence is to live a life free of distraction. That's the challenge. 
I think I can discern pretty well that if I was to ask you this morning, do you want to abide in God's presence, every single hand would go up. So what's the problem? Why can't I do it, Brad? Because we don't guard our hearts. We don't live vigilant. We don't live on guard. We don't live alert. We leave the back door unlocked. And the enemy who watches us and prowls about like a roaring lion, he waits for those open places, those unguarded places those unprotected places, and then he begins to sliver his way in because he's a snake. And he sneaks into our life, not with destruction, but distraction. And the challenge I have found in my life to living a life where I abide in the presence of God is learning how to live a life free of distraction. We know Satan's mission, it's destruction. But Satan's mission is different from Satan's strategy. How does he accomplish his mission? With an effective strategy, and his strategy is distraction. Long before evil can destroy you, it works to distract you. Because distraction from God works to cultivate distance from God. If Satan can keep you busy, he'll keep you out of the presence of God. If Satan can keep you distracted, he'll soon fulfill his plan of destruction. And you know what? He's pretty patient. He doesn't care if it takes 10 years, 10 months, 10 days. I truly believe that evil cannot prevail in the life of the one who is focused on, who's intentionally and purposefully choosing to dwell in the presence of God. I believe it because that's what the psalmist declared in Psalm 91. As believers, we're charged. Scripture tells us, be sober, be vigilant, be alert. Don't be drunk on the cares of this world. That's distraction. Get off social media. Turn off the news. Turn off the TV. Change the radio station. Maybe change friends. Create disciplines. Return to your first love. Do your first works over, he says. Be sober. What should we be looking for? We should be on the alert for what could distract us and draw us away from the presence of God. Distractions. I just listed a few. Busyness. Electronic devices. Media. Entertainment. Social media. Comparison. Temporary pleasures. Discouragement. Confusion. Weariness. Sorry, that's my list. I, I just read you my list. I don't know what's on your list, but that's my list. This is what Jesus was teaching us to pray. I remember the prayer that Jesus taught us, the model prayer. By the way, he didn't say pray this. He said pray like this. Remember the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? He said this, deliver us from evil. Now, don't contradict your prayer if you're asking God to deliver you from evil, but yet you're opening your life up to evil. Okay, God can't deliver what you're feeding. So, delivers from... And then he says, then he says this, what does he say? Lead me not into temptation. Shut the door to distraction.
So what's your distraction? What are your distractions? I read you, read you just a few of mine. Mike, you can come this morning. For me, one of the best examples, and really this could be an entire series, but we don't have a series to talk about Psalm 91. For me, probably one of the best examples, and there's many throughout Scripture, but probably one of the best examples of someone abiding in the presence of God is Jesus in Matthew chapter 8. In and, and, and Matthew chapter 8, I don't know if you remember what's going on there, but, but Jesus and the disciples are on a ship, on a boat, in the middle of an ocean or sea, in the middle of a storm. And the Bible says in verse 24 that suddenly a furious storm. Anybody ever been caught in the middle of a furious storm? How many would say, Brad, I think I'm in one right now. I cannot name how many times I have felt like I was in a storm. Some of them I created myself. But a lot of them I didn't. The scripture says that suddenly a furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves began to sweep in over the boat. Anybody ever felt like that? I'm going under. I'm being overtaken. You get a report that you did not expect. You get a call that you never planned for. You get news that, 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 that all, of them, all of a sudden your worst nightmare became reality. You went from peace to worry. You went from calm to fear. You went from pure to failure. Scripture says that Jesus was on this boat. And as the storm began to crash in and the waves began to overtake the boat. If you know what's happening in Matthew chapter 8, the disciples, and rightfully so, are frantic. They are scared. They're screaming out for their life. They are, are sure that they're going to die. And Scripture says that Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> the audacity of Jesus to take a nap when I'm scared. What would allow Jesus to be asleep in the midst of a storm and in the midst of chaos because he's abiding in the presence of the Father. Remember what he said? I and my Father are one. What was he expressing? He was expressing closeness, communion, intimacy. And the reason why Jesus could sleep in the midst of a storm It's because of his proximity to the Father, his closeness with the Father. And that's where God is inviting us to live. It's where he's inviting us to dwell. He, he wants us to experience that same rest. Can I leave you with some, some just ways to cultivate the presence of God? I'm just going to read them to you, try my best not to explain or teach too much. But we're closing there's a few ways that I know when these are active in my life I know that they nurture they cultivate they enhance they feed a life of intimacy and abiding in the presence of God when these things are, are taken from my life and I don't prioritize these things this is when things start to go crazy in my life Number one, faithfully attend the house of God on the first day of the week, Sunday. I'm not talking about every other weekend. I'm talking about faithfully. Every time the doors are open, I'm here. First day of the week. It sets the week in order. It places God in first position of my life. If I give God my first, He'll bless the rest. So faithfully attending, being in the house of God regularly. That's one thing that nurtures and, and cultivates this, this life of abiding in God's presence. Secondly, consistent communion with God in prayer. 
What does that include? That means asking God for things, and that means receiving from God things. That means speaking and listening. That means when you're in the car, when you're mowing the yard, when you're cutting a piece of wood, when you're hanging the, the drapes, when you're, when you're folding the towels, there, there's, just a, there's just a consciousness, there's a conversation, there's a communion with God, listening. A lot of my prayer doesn't include my mouth moving. A lot of my prayer just includes my ears yielding. Okay, God. See, he searches the deep parts of my heart. There's a prayer that's going on in my heart all times. But there are times where my mouth confesses what my heart believes. And there are times where my mouth cries out what my heart needs. So there's a verbal communication with the Lord, and then there's a, a deep listening to the Lord. So consistent communion with God in prayer. Thirdly, reading, studying, and meditating on God's Word. Sometimes, church, it's just one verse. It's just one verse, and you just chew on that thing all day. And just the more you chew on it, the more depth and revelation and knowledge and wisdom and correction and direction come out of that verse. Or it might be something that the Lord has spoken to you, and you just inquire of the Lord. There's been things that God would say to me in the oddest times. <laughs> Wake me up out of sleep, God. How rude. And God would say just a simple phrase. And that phrase would just confound me. It wouldn't confuse me. It would confound me. In other words, it would put me in pursuit. It would put me on a chase. God, what do you mean by that? God did it on purpose. Not to withhold his knowledge but so that I would pursue the knowledge of the Lord. So that I would inquire of the Lord. And sometimes it would take me weeks. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever had a word from the Lord and you're like, I don't know what that means, but I know it's from God. And then just out of nowhere, one day, ah, that's what you meant, God. That's what you meant. Personal times of worship and praise to God. Well, what is that? That means, and I don't know about you all, but I do this best in my vehicle. Turn the radio on. Set the stage for praise. I lift up my voice. I lift up my hands. I might tap a foot or two. That's my dancing before the Lord. There's been times in worship before the Lord, just the Lord said, I just want you to, to lay prostrate before me. Just want you to bow yourself before me and hallow my name. I've always been one who, who, who felt that, that your public praise is simply a, a testimony of your private praise. And I'll tell you, God responds. God responds to those times of praise. It's amazing that, that when we lift him up, that he draws us unto himself. There's a, there's a depth of God that we cannot access unless we know how to praise God. How many love to be told you're loved? You know, every now and then, I like, I like somebody to say, man, you, you're pretty handsome. I, I mean, I, I'm not vain or anything, but every now and then, I just want to know, you know. Yeah, thank you, Dad. I love you, too. Well, you know, the Lord loves that. He really does. He loves to hear the verbal expression of your heart. Lord, I love you. I like those, those songs where that's really all it says. <laughs> Another one is fellowship with growing believers. And I, and I want to I wanna qualify it for growing believers. I'm not saying you don't need to be around people who are babes in Christ, but find time to be around others 
who are seeking the Lord. Get around them and find out what's God talking to you about, what God's saying to you. What's God showing you? Oh, man. I hope he shows me the same thing. That's how I was called into ministry. I had a friend that went away for camp all summer and came back and said God called him into ministry. I was like, wait a minute. Uh Uh-uh. You're not getting called to do something for God and, 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 and me not. We're friends here. We're equals. And I remember going to God and saying, God, if you're going to call Josh, you better call me. What is it you've called me to do for you? And he responded. Serving others in need. I'll just read them. I can't expound on them. Prioritize Christ-focused music and media. It's, It's just hard, hard, hard. It's hard to keep our minds stayed on the Lord so that the peace of God would fill our lives when we got Hank Williams Jr. playing. The boy don't even know who God is. I mean, he mentions him occasionally, but he don't know God. It's just, it's just hard for me, and I love music. That's hard when you're a musician because you love the art of music. But there's just sometimes where God says, turn that stuff off. Create an atmosphere where I feel welcome. If you want me, I'm only going where I'm celebrated. I'm only going where I'm wanted. And if the TV channel shows and speaks and, 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 and declares everything that is counter God, he's not going to surround you with his presence listening to biblically sound teaching and preaching podcast YouTube thank God for podcast and then last avoid Christ absent media social media and music eliminate the barrier I, there was a moment where, for some reason, I thought talk radio needed to be, needed to have a place in my life. God told me to turn that stuff off. Because I would find my heart so heavy with the news of man, it became hard to hear the news of God. And God began to show me, He said, You know, Elijah didn't have talk radio. Joshua didn't have talk radio. I mean, Jesus didn't even have talk radio. He didn't even read the newspaper, yet he knew what was going to happen. Let's stand today. I just want to pray over us this morning. It's a simple prayer. I'd love for you to just bow your heads, and I'd love for you just to position your hands. Again, everything that we do outwardly is an expression of, of, of what we're feeling inwardly. And I just would love it if you would just stretch your hands out. I mean, just kind of get in a comfortable position. I'm not asking you to be uh, discomforted, uh, but, but I, I, I just want you to, to express this, this a, a, a yielding, a yielding to God. And I just want to pray over you this morning as we close. I want to pray for you exactly what I've needed people to pray for me in those times where I was at a distance with God. Lord, I just pray for your people this morning. I pray, God, that you would kindle and rekindle a love for your presence. God, I pray that you would renew a right spirit with every single man and woman, boy and girl, within the sound of my voice. Father, I pray that you would make known to them what it is that is distracting them. What is it that is keeping them from abiding in the presence of God? And Lord, I pray that you would give them the grace to abstain. 
Father, I pray that you would give them the wisdom on how to act and how to move so that they can remove those distractions in their life. God, give them the grace to say no and give them the grace to say yes. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would convict us of ungodliness. Lord, that you would show us the things in our life that break your heart. Show us the things in our life that create distance between us and you. And Lord, ultimately, I pray that you would make known to us the greatness of your love. Father, I pray for the one this morning. It's been a long season since they've heard your voice. Father, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, speak to them. Come on, listen to the voice of God. Listen for the voice of God. It's a gentle, small voice. He loves you. He loves you. He's speaking to you right now. I want to encourage you, don't resist him. Don't fight him. Simply yield to him. Can you just whisper to the Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And Father, I pray that you would make us an abiding people. That we would learn to love your presence. That we would learn to dwell in the presence of in the secret place of the Most High. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, this is your desire for our life.